Welcome to Meet the Authors. This, on this the third day of the Sharing Our Knowledge Conference in 2019. This is the, um, I think we've been doing this for uh, about 26 years. We started in 1993. And beginning about 2007, I began hosting a similar presentation in which we ask authors to join us and to speak about their um, publish and works in pro progress. And we have today with us Ernestine Hayes, um, Emily Moore, and Ishmael Hope. Uh, thank you three for joining us. Um, we will be talking about our mutual um, published works and our works in progress. And, and I'm Peter Metcalf, I, a writer publisher and have published several books on uh, Alaska Native topics. And one of the people we hope to have with us today is Bert Adams, who unfortunately was unable to join us. But Bert really needs no introduction because we have a video of him and his uh, life and work in Yakutat that we'd like to play right now. My name is uh, Bertrand Adams, and my Klinkit name is Kadashan. I am uh, a writer and uh, a painter, and I live in Yakutat, Alaska. Uh, living by the ocean, you know, and having grown up fishing and hunting, uh, you know, it just naturally uh, became my, my favorite place. Yakutat actually inspired me to become a writer and an artist. The first thing that attracted me most of all was the mountains. And so one of my first paintings was about Mont Fairweather, you know, and the Aukwe River, you know, coming, coming down. You know, when I would see, see my paintings, I would, I would say, my goodness, you know, I wonder if I could write about that as well. My paintings enabled me to write stories, mostly short stories. I managed to uh, write 15 of the stories that I thought was good enough to publish. I decided that maybe these paintings, you know, should uh, be included in, as illustrations in the story. And when this company first offered to uh, publish my book for me, and I told them that I wanted my watercolors included in it, and they said they had their own illustrator, and I said no. <laughs> And I went on to self-publish, yeah. And as a result of those efforts to self-publish, these books came forth. I'm trying to preserve our culture and our history. We do have a, a really dynamic uh, culture that we can share with the whole world. And I think the whole world can learn, you know, a lot from Native Americans. Well, thank you, Bert Adams, for providing that video introduction. Um, as I said at the um, intro, Bert is unable to make it uh, to this session today, and he sends his regrets. But we fortunately have Ishmael Hope sitting in for him, another um, published writer and poet. And I'd like to start this session with Ernestine Hayes, who um, is a professor emeritus at the University of Alaska, is uh, Alaska's writer laureate, 2016-2018, but I think you're still the writer laureate until such time as you have a replacement. Um, she is a, a, a published author, has published the uh, Blonde Indian, for which she won the American Book Award. Um, it's an Alaska native memoir she'll be talking about in a moment. Uh, she is also, um, the book also uh, rece uh, received an Honoring Alaska Indigenous Literature Award and was a finalist for the Kiriyama Prize and Penn Nonfiction Award. Ernestine is the grandmother of four and the great grandmother of three. That little detail I didn't know, Ernestine. But please uh, introduce the books that you have published and perhaps talk about work in progress. Thank you. So my name's Ernestine Hayes. I would like to begin by acknowledging that we stand on living land that has been indigenous territory since time immemorial. We acknowledge the traditional homelands of the original people of this place, the Okkwan of the Tlingit Nation who have lived on and loved and defended this storied land for hundreds of generations and thousands of years. 
We honor the ancestral, ancient, place-based knowledge of the Akkwan and express our gratitude for the inherent presence of past, current, and future Akkwan generations. Gunachish, Akkwan, Gunachish. I, uh, I was born in Juneau, in the Indian village, right after the Second World War when Alaska was still a territory. For the first several years of my life, I lived with my mother and grandmother. Uh, I lived with my grandmother in the Juneau Indian Village while my mother was in and out of the hospital for tuberculosis. After she came back when I was 15, my mother and I moved to California where I stayed for 25 long years and I never came home, not once. But not a day went by that I didn't long for home. Finally, when I turned 40, I was homeless not for the first time, broke, not for the last time. My sons were either grown or living with their father. My life was in shambles. And I said to myself, let me go home or let me die with my thoughts facing north. It took me eight months to get from San Francisco to Ketchikan, living in my car, <coughs> standing in food lines, sleeping in shelters. When I got to Ketchikan, I was homeless from May to October, camping out, and then I sent for my mother, sent for my sons, and two years later, I made it all the way home to Juneau, and I know I love it more than if I'd never left. One of my first jobs after I came back home to Juneau was at a native theater where we told old stories and sang and drummed old songs. At the end of each performance, we stood in a line on the stage and introduced ourselves in our native language and then translated what we had just said. And I would say, My clinked name is Shankarlakt. My white man name is Ernestine Hayes. I am Eagle. I am of the Burnt House People Clan. I belong to the Wolf House. I am a grandchild of the Gunak Tedi. Yan Washa, I am a Kogwantan woman. Shitka Kwan, my clan, springs from Sitka. The woman standing next to me would step forward and say, Slingit Kenak Kostin, you hut do a sakwa chukane diayakat. I am of the people from the grassy place, and I belong to Glacier Bay. And I love to hear her say that because it describes our relationship to the land. Who our land now belongs to or if land can even be owned is a question for politicians and philosophers, but we belong to the land. There is not one Lingit person, from the most modern corporate executive to the most unsophisticated villager, from the oldest great-grandparent whose dim eyes can see only memories to the youngest child who has just learned to form the words who will not say, this is our land, for we still belong to it. We belong to Tlingit Ani. We can't help but place our love there. Everything has a spirit and everything is alive, and this includes stories. And I think that there's a lot of evidence that says our lives are the way that stories present themselves to the world through us. We all have stories, we all have an understanding and a singular perspective that only we can tell. When I give talks, sometimes I'm told, um, sometimes it's suggested what what I should say. I heard recently about a talk I gave not long ago that um, at a post meeting to the talk I gave, they said, no, you, should, no, you should tell her, don't say those things because, you know, there's people that's too radical. But um, I'm 
going to have to say what I'm going to have to say, and so I'm going to give you two points that I give every time I get people captive in a room. First, almost every source describes the long record of native use and occupation that took place before European contact as prehistory. Indigenous groups, however, possess histories of thousands of years of occupancy and exodus, relocation and settlement, exploration and discovery, embedded throughout the generations in legal process, artistic declaration, symbolic regalia, and oral tradition, at least as accurately and in many cases more accurately than the European system of writing that has been used for so many years to remove rights and appropriate lands. We must always remember that before colonial contact, native cultures possessed vigorous legal systems, effective educational systems, efficient health systems, elaborate social orders, elegant philosophical and intellectual insights, sophisticated kinship systems, complex languages, profitable trade systems, every social institution needed for a culture to flourish for thousands of years. Second, we do well to remind ourselves that had the colonial invasion not taken place, indigenous people would still be living in the 21st century. Our lives would still be modern. Paved roads, airports, and Wi-Fi would still occur. Some things would be different. We would all be speaking our own language. Our children would be receiving educations meant to lead to their success. We would not be so vulnerable to incarceration, alcoholism, poverty. We would be healthy. So I was asked to say a few words about the books that I have out now and what I'm working on. And of course, Blonde Indian was my first book that is based on the uh, master's thesis that I wrote. And um, my second book, The Tao of Raven, it took about 25 or 30 years to write this, write Blonde Indian, as I can attest to by showing you when I was homeless in San Francisco, I wrote some things down on the coarse um, hand towel that was in the, in the uh, women's uh, shelter that I spent every night in the city in the Tenderloin Inn, and this became part of my book. And two years before that, I wrote this on something called a typewriter. <laughs> and you can see how we used to delete, right? You can see how we used to, um, delete the whole page, right? And this is also part of my book. So those became part of Blonde Indian. Took about 25 years to write, and Dow of Raven took about 10 years. And I'm currently working on something that has, bear, uh, has a working title, Bury These Stories, which I flatter myself to say is going to be the third book in this series, and I will have written a trilogy. So I'm uh, working on Bury These Stories, an Alaska Native memoir, and the concept is that it is a first-person memoir of the woman who married a bear. I would like to um, close by reading. Remember that the land is inspirited. It is quickened. When as you conduct your life, you chance to see an eagle or a wolf or a bear, remember that it too is conducting its life and it sees you as well, as does a tree and the forest itself the very land sees you. When you remember this and feel this and know this, you will want to hug the land. You will want to embrace it. And when that happens, you can be sure that the land feels the same way about you. The land loves you. She misses her children. And in addition to those first two points that I say at every opportunity, I close with these last four admonitions that I now say every time I get the opportunity, decolonize, smash the patriarchy, undo capitalism, resist.
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ernestine. We'll have um, questions and answers following the individual presentations. Next, we have Emily Moore, who's recently published a book, Proud Raven, Panting Wolf, Carving Alaska's New Deal Totem Parks. Now, Dr. Emily Moore and a tenured uh, associate professor of art history at Colorado State University, Emily grew up in Ketchikan and graduated from Ketchikan High School. Um, one of the things I most admire about your book, Emily, was the agency that you gave to the carvers and recreating that process by which they accommodated themselves to a government-funded uh, totem carving project that would otherwise not have had the significance that I believe it acquired through their, their contributions. And, um, and the, the other thing that perhaps you can speak about is I was also impressed with the relative enlightened attitude of the government officials who were sponsoring the project. And you know, I think it was a period of time because we all, our country goes through eras of, of um, emphasizing colonialism, as Ernestine spoke to. And in the, during the New Deal era, there at least was some blossoming of interest in, in um, art in, you know, of the people from Appalachia to, as it turns out, Southeast Alaska. So, Emily, please uh, present your works. Gosh, cheesh. And I'd just like to acknowledge that many people in this room really helped me write this book. It was not as long as Ernestine's work. It took me 10 years to research this work. And I feel very unpoetic going after your beautiful um, talk. But um, Peter and Ishmael Hope, I especially would like to recognize and thank for all of their help as I was researching this. So the book was titled Proud Raven Panting Wolf, and I just have a few slides that I can go through as I try to address some of Peter's points. Um, <coughs> this was a program from 1938 to 1942 during the New Deal period where um, Clinkett and Haida men were paid $2 a day by the US government to restore ancestral poles, 19th century poles from ancestral native villages. Most of these were in southern southeast Alaska, where the majority of monumental exterior poles stood. Um, but there were a few here in Juneau. Uh, the CCC also restored poles in the Sitka Park, where Governor Brady had brought mostly Haida poles from Prince of Wales Island in the early 20th century. So over the course of these four years, there were 121 totem poles that were repaired, replicated, and a few newly designed for these parks. It was a massive program. And as Peter said, it's really interesting to wonder why the US government actually supported totem pole carving in this period after 50 years of outright suppression, right? Encouraging people to burn poles, um, condemning them as heathen objects. Um, and when I did that research, as Peter was saying, the, the New Deal was a really interesting period for revisions between federal tribal relationships. It was the Indian Reorganization Act, which had a lot of problems, but did try to recognize more tribal sovereignty and build in, um, it was the end of a lot of boarding schools. They started day schools instead. It was the end of the Dawes Allotment Act that had dated from 1887. So trying to restore communal tribal property again. So there was a, a big federal shift. And I think later in this presentation, uh-oh, is it gonna advance? It's not going forward. Well, there was a beautiful oh, there was a beautiful poll by John Wallace that was in front of the Museum of Modern Art, and I think I have the slide here somewhere. Yes, this was in 1941, and I love this slide as an example of this interest, a nationwide interest during the New Deal period, the interwar period, where non-natives were very interested in Native American art in part because they were appropriating it as a unique American, a uniquely American design tradition that Europe couldn't claim, right? So there was a lot of cultural nationalism going on where the US was trying to find something unique to itself. But on the positive side of that, it led to a lot of um, federal dollars going to support native arts. And that's partly where these totem parks came from. 
So I'll, if I can make it go back, seems to be a little bit of lag time. I skipped ahead here. Um, the first step in the program was for the Forest Service, which oversaw the whole CCC program, to um, get permission from native leaders who owned these various poles. You know what, I'm just gonna come over real quick and, and physically press on my computer. Will that work? Can I borrow your mic, Peter? Yes. Because then I can really control this. Um, so the first step was to, for the Forest Service to identify the poles that they wanted to restore. And they worked with native leaders and different communities to go around and um, do this kind of reconnaissance mission to identify poles that were quote unquote worthy of restoration. And they uh, signed memorandum of agreement with native leaders and owners of these poles to release the poles to the US government for restoration. This was hugely controversial amongst many native communities because of course the US government had no moiety relationship you know, between opposites. They didn't have the right to a lot of these poles. But um, it's very interesting to see some of the letters that um, indigenous leaders like Robert Paradovich from Cloak wrote some very impassioned letters about how clan leaders and clans still needed to be involved in these restorations and that it would be okay as long as the government honored those relationships. So all of these poles were cut down, brought into CCC camps. You can see in the bottom slide here, the, they used the basement of A and B halls in many communities. It was the only big space where they could put a 40 foot totem pole and um, restore or replicate it. If, it was, if the 19th century wood was sound enough to restore, they could insert small wooden pegs to replace the rotten areas. If the pole was too far gone, they had to replicate it completely. And so there are many replicas that were placed in the New Deal parks. And then the men had to, I mean, the physical labor involved in all of this is just incredible to realize they were clearing the land to create room for these parks, um, raising them by hand. This was the very first pole that was raised in the Saxman Totem Park. It was the Sun Raven Pole. Um, owned by Andy Moses of the Tongass tribe. And it's still there at the base of the Saxman Totem Park. Something that really caught my attention when I was doing the research for this um, totem pole project was the fact that this New Deal program of 1938 to 1942 falls squarely within the Alaska Native Brotherhood and Alaska Native Sisterhood's efforts for the Clinkett and Haida land claims lawsuit against the US government. And um, I put the timeline up here. In 1929, the A &E, B and ANS voted at this famous Haynes Convention that's pictured here to make the land claims lawsuit their number one priority. By 1935, during this New Deal period, Roosevelt signed, President Roosevelt signed the Jurisdictional Act recognizing that Tlingit and Haida people had a legitimate claim and they had the right to sue the federal government for those land claims. In 1939, Central Council was created as the federally recognized tribe to negotiate that, that lawsuit. The federal government refused to um, negotiate with the A and B and Peter's written a lot about this. And in, there was a delay because of the outbreak of World War II, but in 1944, testimony began for that lawsuit. And I'm sure most of you know, um, it took a long time for that lawsuit to be settled. But the point here was when I was reading all of the letters from different leaders who are participating in the totem pole restoration program, and also comparing rosters of the men who were enrolled in the CCC and members of the A and B, they were almost identical, right? So you have to think about the fact that these men are cooperating with the Forest Service, restoring these totem poles, and then going to A and B meetings where they are actively trying to figure out how to prove their land claims to the Forest Service, to the federal government, for the Tongass National Forest, for all that land that had been taken by um, presidential proclamation. And so this became really powerful to um, help read some of the letters for me because 
If you look at many of the polls that were actually signed over to the US government, many of them were explicit records of land title. The fact that different native clans owned particular sockeye salmon streams. This is a, um, a very famous pool down in the Cloak Totem Park, the sockeye salmon pool. It's the Nastedi clan, if I am pronouncing that correctly. And they claim the sockeye salmon stream that's right from the Cloak um, Lake out to the Cloak River. And so this pool had stood beside that salmon stream um, since the 19th century, they restored it using government funds, and this particular poll was actually entered as evidence into the Clinkett and Haida land claims lawsuit. It became um, a way to buttress the oral tradition of this clan's you know, property. So this was so powerful to learn. There, were, there are more polls. This is the Hazy Island poll in the Cloak Park with um, rights, I'm, I apologize, forget the clan who owned um, the rights to the mirror eggs that are depicted here. Um, they, so that's also not stated, they have Hazy Island. Hazy Island, yeah. Gonsch. Um, Deiki Nu, that's where the raven, uh, that's where Anuk, who had the fresh water and the raven oh. took it from him at Deiki Nu, that's Hazy Island. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anyway, um, I'd grown up in Ketchikan um, seeing the importance of these parks for 21st century communities and 20th century when I was growing up. And, um, they, but they were always dismissed in scholarly literature as just kind of inauthentic tourist arts that had been done you know, without real regard for communities. And that's just not true. When you really study what was going on in the 30s, this was a, a very potent time where Native leaders were finding any way they could to interface with the US government and to assert those claims. And the totem parks became very important, not only for asserting land claims, but for bringing back the clan poles into co uh, contemporary communities where they could teach the stories to younger generations. I think I have this, I love this photo of Henry Denny Sr. You can see he's being filmed by the US government, but he really was telling these clan stories to this new generation who hadn't had the polls in their community before then. So it was, a, it was an honor to do this research and there's still a lot more to be done. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. Um, I, I must admit to an affinity with you for being a, a non-native who grew up in this region like myself. And it's just really encouraging to see somebody of your generation, younger than mine, who is um, so interested in Clinkett art and culture. And you know, I've thought about that a lot in terms of people saying, oh, how much I respect the culture and that sort of thing. Fundamental of respect is interest and curiosity and actually learning. And Emily is an academic who's done a lot of study and um, has produced some wonderful work that, by the way, will be selling books at the uh, APK after the session and uh, uh, signing those for those of you who wish to have a signature on uh, these books. And all of these authors will have their books available as well as. Bert um, Adams' books, who uh, is, again, Bert is unable to attend. And uh, fortunately, Ishmael Hope, who's our executive director of the Sharing Our Knowledge Conference, um, is standing in for Bert, and rightfully so. Uh, Ishmael is a published author. Um, he's written a couple and written and published a couple books of poetry, which he'll talk about, and then has also contributed poetry to Indian Country Magazine, Poetry Magazine, and Native Voices, an anthology of Native po poetry. Um, Ishmael is also the son of my late friend, An Andrew Hope III, who started the Sharing and Knowledge Conference along with our late friends, uh, Dick and Nora Downhauer, and this got started in 1980 or 1993, in, uh, the first one was in Haynes and Kluckwan, and there were a couple subsequent sharing and knowledge conferences, um, and it restarted in 2007 in Sitka, 2009 in Juneau, and then we've been doing it every other year 
basically back and forth between Juno and Sitka. So, Ishmael, um, please inform us of your, your published works and works in progress. Thank you. Right on, Gunnar Yeah, Peter talking about the long-standing connections of, with his family and, and, you know, it, it goes to his siblings and also going back to people like Vern Metcalf, who is good friends with my great grandfather Andrew Hope Senior, who, you know, did, was a part of the territorial legislature. Um, they both served together, uh, Vern and Andrew, Andrew Senior. Pa. And uh, Peter is affectionately known as Bushka. I don't think we've heard that too much around here, but we, we but for the old timers like Marie Olson and Andy, well, Andy's not quite an old timer, but you know, they call you uh, Bushka, Andy Ibona, and um, his sister Andrea. And it's been great to work with, with Peter on this whole thing. Um, just the fine understanding of organizing events and bringing people together and and also since peter may not i i really want to mention peter's book a dangerous idea which is relevant to some of the paul family that i hear i see here which really helps to highlight if it, if it does one major thing it does a lot in that short book but one major thing is to highlight the legal theory that that allowed for us to get so many of uh, our land uh, secured again. You know, we always claim our land. We know we always own it, but sometimes it doesn't work politically. But uh, Peter helped to highlight the legal theory developed by William Paul Schwindy. You know, that, that made that happen. And I really appreciated what uh, Ernestine uh, has said about her uh, background and, and just tracing that lineage of, of getting to this stage. Yeah, that was, and, and uh, we've spoken before about the, how important it is to highlight the 20th century people who've, who've been through uh, so much and their stories, that that's, that that's just as important as our clan history. And, I, you know, I really just consider, you know, uh, my father, my mother, uh, sadly enough, they didn't live too long. You know, they've, they've had their traumas and their, they had an illness, each of them, you know, and my own brother who was on these streets, uh, Andy the fourth, uh, and recently passed away, you know, that, that, that there's right in my own family and many of our families, uh, were, were trying to work through traumas and sometimes it could feel every day just just living here <laughs> you know some a thing after a thing after a thing but um, it's amazing when things like this can come together so just Ernestine speaking on that you know just gave me a courage to uh, to, to mention that you know that we, we remember our our family remember our people that are struggling and if they can't be in the room with us there's something missing mm. and there's there's something that we need to keep doing to feel like help them feel like they're included and they're loved mm. so and I, I want also wanted to mention uh, Emily Moore's book Proud Raven uh, Panting Wolf it's it's a leading Northwest Coast art scholarship book and one thing that's amazing is through these clan conferences and the various permutations is that the conversations that we have, we make the connections. And we just saw yesterday with Ed Coons, who no, carries the history of how the CCC polls have been put up here in Juneau. And Ed was able to tell people and tell Emily about that history. I hope you got to the part of, of the, the raven beak. <laughs> you did? <laughs> it's a funny, really, I, we got it recorded, so it's going to be on YouTube, but I just really enjoyed Ed telling about the beak that they put up the totem pole, but they didn't put the beak up until the pole was all the way up. 
<laughs> and they, they said, oh, we should have just put it on before, while it was laying on the ground. But um, anyway, so it's those kind of things that we need to know, we need to document and, and get that history. And something that is really magnificent is finding these master carvers uh, like John Wallace, whose pole is up at the City Museum, Charles Brown, uh, Tom Ucas, uh, just a really a number of uh, George Benson um, from Sitka. You know, they were master carvers and carvers in Ed's own family, you know. Um, Ed's father, Ed Sr., was a carver. Ed is a uh, silversmith. You know, so just to highlight that, that, that there's actually faces to these people that make these works. And similar to the attributions we need to make of Renaissance painters or sculptors, we need to do that with Clinkett art, with Northwest Coast art. And also just to mention that the, the deep tradition of the weavers and and the spruce root basket makers and the, the Chilkat blanket makers and raven's tail weavers um, and the history that, that needs to be elevated there too and just right, we see right today the, the we, at the weavers gathering um, and the, a lot of the special work doing going on there. I should also mention, there's even documentation of a woman carver in traditional times uh, from the Kaguantan clan that uh, Lewis Shotridge was able to document. They have a feast dish that, that a, a woman, um, I forget her clinket name, I forget her name, but uh, we, so that we should also recognize that, that, you know, Alison Marks is a, also a carver of today. And in traditional times, though there weren't as many, that it's at least acknowledged that, the, that there's, that's in our history. It's a special kind of thing to just to know, know those things. And that's what I think this kind of thing does is the multidisciplinary, uh, multi-ethnic uh, approach of uh, just bringing people together while centering Native people uh, creates so many opportunities. Um, and so I, I just wanted to, I, I think on the, the multicultural literature part, that there's also a history there. And, and Ernestine is right in the middle of it, being the second Alaska State Laureate after Nora Downhauer, um, who, was, who served uh, just a few years before. Um, and when Nora was appointed, something that she said was, oh, it's about time. Because it's not just including Native people, it's recognizing the achievements that rival any other group. That they're, not just because you want to have a native writer laureate, but because they're great, you know. And and that to see Ernestine carry on that tradition, and that that there's a a native uh, literature movement that's been, um, you know. Of course, we have our oral literatures. You know, Ed is a is a bearer of that um, that tr that tradition, that literature, which is some of the finest literature anyone will find in the world. And in, on a written uh, from 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 the track of written literature, uh, since about the '60s and '70s, a lot of exciting things have been happening. And Ernestine, uh, myself, a little bit, my parents uh, are also keyed into that multi-ethnic flowering, you know, and now we have a, uh, a, a poet laureate of the United States who's native, Joy Harjo, mm -hmm. who knows Ernestine and, and is a part of that whole thing and was close to my parents who were also poets. My, my mother uh, was the first Inuit poet that published in 1984, published her own book of poetry. Uh, sister Goodwin was her pen name. Uh, we, we often called her sister, uh, or Elizabeth Hope. And then my father was also part of that, and 
mainly as someone, someone like, a, like what he's done with the Klan conference. He did those kind of conferences since the 70s. You know, and he just started a Klan conference in 1993. So we go back to 1993 as a Klan conference, but I really see that tradition going back to 1975, which if you go to that uh, archival film showcase, you'll get a, you might catch a snippet of a young Andy Hope when he was in his 20s, you know, with some of the great elders and some poets, the jazz musician Jim Pepper, Ka Indian, the most famous native jazz musician. Jim Pepper was also in his 20s. And here they are talking to the elders. I mean, just amazing stuff. And that the Klan Conference continues that a bit. But my father was also a, a poet himself and, and a scholar and a writer. Uh, we still need to get his collection of, of poetry uh, published, which Ishmael Reed, where I get my name from, uh, would publish. And so one thing that Joy does, which is very rare actually, um, unless people have been in it, is remember, remember that lineage. And there, we can quickly forget, you know, people like, you know, when it comes to poetry. I've talked to other uh, uh, poets, other native writers in the lower 48, and it's, it's, it could be very, very peculiar where they feel like they're the first ones who've ever done things, even though they're all amazing, those poets and, and, and writers. Uh, uh, but it could be very peculiar if you forget even just your parents' generation and what they've done. Um, but one thing that's special is Joy remembers, and she's going to publish a native poetry anthology as the poet laureate of the United States, and it's going to include my parents, you know, um, and hopefully Nora Downhauer. Nora Downhauer is maybe the most anthologized native poet of any Native American poet, and one of the most accomplished and amazing poets Yet you may you could go you may go to any native writer of today and they might not even know who Nora uh, was, and so it's it's just it occurs to me just that it's it's so vital to not just remember ancestral traditions, but like August Wilson when he talks to his black community. You know, August Wilson was one of the most significant uh, American playwrights. He, tell, he used to tell uh, other young black playwrights, you know, you don't need to go to Timbuktu uh, right for the first thing. What about grandma? You know, what about grandma's recipes and her stories? You know, um, and, and I relate to that in just engaging in this work that doing poetry and building a, a literary community has roots and you feel those roots if you just try to build those relationships and, and retain some of those memories and talk to your, your poetry elders, your writer elders, and, and have a chance to just recognize that, uh, you know, you're not the first poet or you're not the first writer who, you know, who, who, who attended to a page, but you have something going on. And that's to me what makes us better writers, what makes us better scholars, um, having those, creating a milieu. I believe Richard and Nora Downhauer really, really knew that, really, really tended to that. Um, because you, you start to see how these different disciplines and how scholarship and literature can feed each other and how the elder's words is deeply attentive to the scholarship. And they would call uh, elders deeply intellectual. You know, I, I could think, again, the Paul family, you know, William Paul was a traditional elder. And he was also an intellectual in the Western sense. 
uh, I should I, I do want to mention the Alaska Clinket, um, the book that William Paul wrote that was uh, posthumously published in about 2011 by his daughter Frances de Germain. It's one of the most significant uh, cultural knowledge books you'll find anywhere. And it's particularly with clan migrations, which we just got out of with Tom Thornton and then elders following up, telling their clan migration histories and their responses to the great flood. So William Paul's book is situated right there as a central text of something that hasn't been published that much piecing all together how these clans, basically the whole Clinket nation, got to where they were they are today. And William Paul spent time with the elders like Yeh Chak, who was a Ghanech Tedi uh, clan leader in the early 19th century, early 20th century, and other elders, including his mother, Tilly Paul Tamri, Kathyat, you know, so, that's just to say there's so much going on and w the more you engage in the stuff, you, the more you see how it all ties together. And my two poetry books, uh, first one in 2014 was uh, Quarter Sons of Flounder Hill. And the second one is Rock Piles Along the Eddy. Uh, there's a delightful quote from Ernestine in the back here. Um, and Vivian Prescott, uh, who uh, is a, a terrific writer in the Wrangell area. And um, maybe I'll just read, just read one poem from um, this one, my second collection, Rock Piles Along the Eddy. And, uh, and I should also mention this poetry magazine. In June 2018, just last year, uh, Hyde Erdrich, who's, who's Louise's uh, sister, but Hyde is one who has really fostered that literary community that I'm trying to talk about. And for the first time, there was a Native Poets issue of, uh, in Poetry Magazine. It's the longest running um, and I guess prestigious uh, poetry magazine you got there. And just really neat to see Native Poets in there. And so I got a, I got a wild and crazy uh, surrealist uh, poem, you know, l lengthy uh, snippet of a poem um, going on in this book. So yeah, why don't, why don't I just read, read a poem and call it good. So this is called uh, Tribal College, no, 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 yes, uh, Canoe Launching Into the Gaslit Sea. Now, as much as ever, and as always, we need to band together form a lost tribe, scatter as one, burst through rifle barrels guided by the spider's crosshairs. We need to knit wool sweaters for our brother sleeping under the freeway, hand him our wallets and bathe his feet in holy water. We need to find our lost sister, last seen hitchhiking Highway 16 or panhandling on the streets of Anchorage Couch surfing, with, couch surfing with relatives in Victoria, or kicking out her boyfriend after a week of partying in a trailer park in Salem, Oregon. Now, as much as ever, and as always, we need to register together, lock arms at the front lines, brand ourselves with mutant DNA strands, atomic whirls, and serial numbers, adding ourselves to the blacklist. We need to speak in code, languages the enemy can't break, slingshot garlic cloves and tortilla crumbs, wear armor of lily pads and sandstone carved into the stately faces of bears and the faraway look of white-tailed deer. We need to run uphill with rickshaws, play frisbee with trash lids, hold up portraits of soldiers who never made it home, organize a peace in on the walls of the Grand Canyon. We need to stage earnest satirical plays, hold debate contests with farm animals at midnight, fall asleep on hammocks hanging from busy traffic lights. 
now as much as ever, and as always, we need to prank call our senators, take selfies with the authorities at fundraisers we weren't invited to, kneel in prayer at burial grounds crumbling under dynamite. We need to rub salve on the belly of our hearts, meditate on fault lines as the earthquakes, dance in robes with fringe that spits medicine, make love on the eve of the disaster. Thank you, Ishmael. Um, sitting here and watching you wonderful authors and people uh, talk about your work, it makes me realize how um, kind of interconnected we are, all are with our, our uh, place where we live. And, and having Ed Coons and other people in the audience, but Ed, uh, I want to... Uh, honor especially because you're somebody who uh, I very much enjoy your friendship and also you know we go back a long ways and I knew Ed's mother Cecilia um, Coons and um, and that goes back to my days uh, right after high school my first job was with the Citizens Participation Committee of the Model Cities program and that's where I began to work with a lot of Alaska Natives as an adult. Up until that time, I was just Vern Metcalf's son. As Ishmael pointed out, my father had um, many deep relationships with Alaska Natives, and that's kind of opened the door for me. But when I worked for the Citizen Participation Committee, um, a Andy Hope hired me, or Andy Ibona hired me, and I worked with him and um, uh, Walter and Mary Lee Johns and uh, Bob Beerley and um, and that led to many associations with other Alaska Natives, and uh, including Cecilia Coons, who um, she was very much a Clinket woman, and I couldn't read her. I didn't know if she even knew me, let alone liked me. But she showed up at my going away party when I was leaving for college, and um, and I remember Mary Lee John saying, "This is a big deal, Peter. She showed up for your going away party." And, I had, like I say, I had no idea she even knew who I was. So it was um, it was qu quite an honor. But that led to a, um, a career eventually, beginning in 1980, where uh, by that time Andy Ibona, who had hired me 10 years previously, was uh, executive director of the Central Council of Clink and Haida Indian Tribes of Alaska, and. Um, uh, Ishmael's grandfather, John Hope, was the president of the uh, Central Council. So um, they gave me my first job in writing, and I wrote a, a short history of the uh, Central Council. And that led to other projects. And that kind of set me off on a direction that included, that has led to a lot of different publications I've worked on and produced. Um, and for most of the Alaska Native organizations of Southeast Alaska, including uh, all but I think one Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act Corporation and um, and several tribes, both regional and local, um, and so I've made my living as a you know as a paid writer. And um, when I worked for the Citizen Participation Committee back in 1971-72, that was my first and last salaried position. So for those of you who are um, interested in writing, especially a younger generation, you can make a living doing this. Uh, you can make a living as a writer as uh, probably more comfortably in an academic setting, um, but that comes with its own responsibilities. And Ishmael is out there producing a lot of creative writing and uh, you know it's not something that necessarily pays well, but hopefully it's all worth it in the end in terms of uh, recognition and honors. Um, because I'm a, essentially a commercial writer, I know what it takes very specifically to write a book. And it takes to do a, uh, a well-researched book. It takes about two years of what you might think of as a regular job. It's about 1,800 to 2,000 hours of time to do a, a well-researched book. So that's what you're looking at if you're getting into the writing game. It's a lot of hard work, but in the end, it's a, um, it can be very rewarding. And um, 
So I would like to bring this to a close with an uh, opportunity for those of you who wish to ask any questions to do so. And if uh, you do wish to uh, ask any questions, please walk up to the mic. Anybody interested in addressing any of our authors? Dinah? Yes. The Oh, hang on a moment. This is Dinah Hobson. Goodness, cheese. Is it on? Oh, okay. Yeah, just want to, uh, Dinah Hobson, uh, Shark Clan, from New Hit. Uh, D is my uh, uh, grandfather's people. But anyway, um, I work for the school district. I also work for Gold Belt Heritage Foundation. And um, I just want to compliment Ernestine and Ishmael uh, for the writings you have produced so far. I use them in my lit class with, um, well, I'm assigned a group of, of children. Um, I first used your writings um, at Floyd Dryden for middle school kids. And I was in this classroom, this English classroom, all year long. And uh, January, um, the teacher decided to teach, or had planned to teach poetry writing to the students, the different styles of poetry writing. And the, the classroom was, was half, uh, half uh, Alaska Native from uh, all over Southeast Alaska. And I watched them all year, and they, they just were not all that interested in the, the lit that was being taught in, in the classroom by uh, this teacher, European teacher. I mean, it was good literature uh, for basics, you know, but the, the native kids didn't really have much interest in, in her teaching. But uh, in January, when she introduced poetry writing, different styles, uh, she had us all go to the library. And uh, I took my group to the library. My, my uh, office was in there, Indian Studies office. And I had all your writings in there. And uh, so I introduced the kids to the students to your writings. And a light went off. They really loved the place-based writing. And uh, they became very interested in writing their own works. I introduced the Downhowers, you know, um, uh, poetry, her poetry, and her writings to the students. And you couldn't keep them quiet. And they wanted to talk about their uncles, uh, fishing with their uncles and putting up fish with aunties and picking berries in the smokehouse and uh, um, um, all the different Alaska Native activities that we do, uh, eating pilot bread and fish and, and uh, all of that. And they loved it and you couldn't keep them quiet. And the kids would say, oh, I'm from Yakutat, I'm from Haines, I'm from Juneau, I'm from Angoon, I'm from Kassan. And they talk about their families and their food and you know what their families uh, do, going to celebration and putting on atu, and they wanted to talk about their atu. They want to write about it. And the teachers had the, the teacher had these students um, stand up in front of the class and talk about their, their writings, their native writings. And the students loved it. The, the students that were not natives, they loved, they loved hearing these different um, experiences from the Alaska Native students. And I'm in, uh, I'm in, uh, I'm at Riverbend now, and I'm with uh, uh, fifth grade, fourth and fifth graders, and they've assigned me, a, it's called a win class. It's a lit, uh, a lit session. And so I bring in also your writings, and they, the students just, they just love it, and they, it really helps them. So continue to keep writing, and uh, it's good for the, the Native kids. Thank Thank you, Donna. Wow. That's what it's for, <laughs> that kind of thing. That's what the work's for. That's great. Indeed. I'm Michael Paul, and uh, <clears throat> 
Scaliel, Tricky Raven, and uh, that my whole family thought was perfect for me. <laughs> and um, but this is about uh, a, a question for. Um, oh my God! I forgot your name. Ernestine. Ernestine. Thank you. <laughs> <coughs> and that uh, about healthcare, health knowledge, healthcare knowledge, and um, my. Um, Grandmother uh, Frances Lackey Paul wrote the book um, Gataha and uh, back around World War II, and it was about her mother in law and um, first approximate 12 years of her, of her mother in law's life, uh, born native. And um, uh, it's, it's a wonderful book, and you, you, you may have run into it. Um, and, um, but she got. Um, the uh, swine flu in 1919, and um, a white woman and uh, was dying, and her um, her mother-in-law, um, Tilly Paul, who's um, her uh, our cousin Ben Paul is going to be uh, doing a presentation on this afternoon at I think three, and um, and she nursed my grandmother back to health. And so she's half native and much more vulnerable to that disease. And uh, nursing her um, uh, daughter-in-law, uh, a white woman, white woman back to health. And she used intense ways, traditional ways that involved um, constant bathing, constant forcing of fluids, um, and cleaning up the mess of a person who has uh, the flu and um, just constant attendance, and then we don't know what. And um, we don't know what else went on. We just have those vague few things that uh, brought my uh, grandmother back to health. And um, could you speak to, if you know, um, about what, I mean, healthcare knowledge, from what you say, was very extensive and powerful, and um, is there more that you can you can talk to us about? I really appreciate that um, you get, giving a little bit of a background. I really um, admire and honor your work and your family and your history, Gun Chish. Um, my my family. Uh, lived in Juneau, in the Juneau Indian Village. And my, uh, my mother was in and out of the hospital. And my grandmother and grandfather were, um, they both drank. And so did my uncles and aunts and my family. Um, alcoholism was one of the- We have plenty of that in our family too. Right. Alcoholism is one of the many um, traumas that, um, that our family and the, all the communities endured. I remember my grandmother giving me teas, and um, uh, of course we had a native diet. And I think the native diet, I was just thinking the other day, um, I had a bone scan, and I'm doing, I'm doing really good, especially for my age. I'm 74, and um, they did a bone scan, and I'm, I'm in pretty good shape. And um, I was wondering, well, why? You know, I don't take pills or vitamins or calcium or anything. And I remembered when I was a little girl, and it was time to, um, you know, to, to eat, I got the pieces that had the gristle and the skin and so on. And I used to think, well, that was because I'm, you know, I was a little girl and, you know, my uncle's got the good parts. But I'm starting to think that the diet that we're given, because I started reading about it, and gristle's good for you, right? It's still one of my favorite things to eat. I was up at Howard Luke Camp this summer for a week. And they went out and fished every day, and they brought this one. They, they had they made fish soup, and it had a it had a nose 
on the airline. The nose is my favorite part. It had a nose that was as big as an apple, and they gave it to me, and I'm just like, yummy, yummy. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking diet, right, and lifestyle, and the, the, the teas, and the um, seal oil, and, and those things that come from where we come from is uh, probably what, what my grandmother depended on to keep us healthy. I, I got um, rheumatic fever uh, when I was a girl from untreated um, scarlet fever, and I've, I've got a, um, a, a bad condition in my ear. I'm deaf in this ear because of uh, uh, growth in there, and they say that that comes from an untreated infection when you were little. So um, I, I know that a lot of Native families kept that history, but... Um, I think my my family just had um, just just had a lifestyle and no particular medicines except the teas my grandmother gave me and the diet she gave me. But I'm wondering if Ishmael knows some some further. Well, here's a good sharing our knowledge uh, moment. Uh, but I I just want to recognize this is a sensitive one. Um, but it's, it's an opportunity to share knowledge, so we'll at least get documented from an elder who has passed on, and so I retain what he told me, um, and I'm not sure it's around. When my mother-in-law had uh, cancer, he talked about going to Auk Bay, uh, going to Auk Lake, and getting those lily pads, and um, getting a few of those, and chopping them all up, and boiling them. And that he knew of an elder who did that when they had cancer and had those lily pads. Hmm. So that's uh, something that I did with a friend. And we shouldn't take, obviously, we should leave those unless there's a, you know, you know, try it. People are going to try that out and maybe it's, there's, there should be tests. I don't know, you know, how much. But he just said boil it and have a few sips at a time every day. Uh, as much as you can handle and but uh my mother-in-law didn't elect to do that because you know there's there's a risk of taking something that you're not familiar with but that's just to say that's knowledge that elders do retain and there's a lot of elders who said though they don't there's another side called kayani which is uh it just translates directly to plants but when you talk about Kayani, that's like shamanic uh, medicines. And those, those ones I'm going to be, I know of one plant that, that was used as Kayani, but I'm not going to talk about it for now because of how elders say we have to be so sensitive about that. Um, and elders, for the most part, because of the lack of training now, they don't approach that because it requires that training of people who know about how shamans handled those those medicines but uh there are some native medicines that are not shamanic like that um that some elders still uh, retain and i should also mention vivian mork who uh, does a lot of traditional medicine medicinal knowledge and has even been given presentations on that and we are also very familiar, of course, with uh, Devil's Club. The only thing I'd say about that is watch for the overuse. <laughs> you could get rashes. You know, it's, it's a strong, strong medicine. So uh, it's, it's really used as medicine. But now people just, they're just chugging it. <laughs> and, the, and that could really do stuff with your blood pressure and all kinds of stuff. So, yeah, just sharing our knowledge. Thank you, Ishmael, and thank you for the question. And one of the great things about the Sharing Our Knowledge Conference, also known as the Clan Conference, as Ishmael referred to it, it's become our kind of shorthand, but um, is that it brings to Juno, in this case, the descendants of um, 
Tilly and Louis Paul, and I also met some uh, descendants of um, Louis Paul died at a young age in a tragic canoe accident, but um, Tilly went on to, uh, her second marriage was to William Tamory, and there were descendants of, uh, of that marriage as well here at the uh, uh, Sharing Our Knowledge Conference. And um, Ben Paul, our guest um, cousin, will be presenting. He's presented before. And um, so this, this brings together a lot, of, uh, a lot of families and a sharing of knowledge. I want to wrap this up by recognizing, kind of tying a couple threads together. Um, Ishmael cited the book that was published by uh, William Paul's daughter, Frances uh, Paul, and um, it was um, The Alaska Clinket, Where We Come From, which is based on the, the uh, writings and research of William Paul Sr. And then there's uh, Fred Paul, who wrote yeah. The f that's then fight for it, and that's about the Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act. And What's the whole uh, title? <laughs> What's the whole title? <laughs> I'll leave that to you. Ish. The largest British, the largest redistribution of wealth in the history of mankind. Is that what it was? Yeah, yeah. excellent. Wow. And the excellent. history of the North Slope yeah. <laughs> But I, I just want to say that in in the the framework of those of us that are sitting on this pe panel, we've had the good fortune of having uh, some of our work published in well-designed um, and properly published books with editorial help and that sort of thing. Um, these books are a little more rough draft, but I use them constantly. I mean, there's just rich material in there, so don't be put off by a book that doesn't look like it came out of uh, some big publishing house. These yeah. are important, essential work if Absolutely. you're into researching Alaska Native history. and. Um, and I'm really uh, grateful to the Paul family for all the contributions you have made to our state, basically. I mean, we would not be the place we are today without the contributions of the Paul family. So thank you very much. And I would like to bring this to a close now so we can move on to our next assignment, which is the um, meet the authors at the APK, the Alaska State Museum. And we'll be moving there next. So thank you very much for uh, um, being here and watching this presentation, and thank you. <laughs>